It's about 12.30 on September 9th, 2021, Calvin Castine at uh, the Government Center, Clinton County Government Center here in, in Plattsburgh. And our state senator, Dan Stack, is about to address the crossing the border problem. We have various county legislators here and people from Dan Stack's office. Looks like our county chairperson, uh, Mark Henry, will do the introductions. Good uh, showing from the local media. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming here today. Uh, today is going to be uh, my privilege to introduce uh, Senator Dan Steck, our senator. Uh, senator Steck has been very active. Uh, he's been in our area a lot, uh, speaking on many, many different issues uh, that are important to our area. Uh, and today, uh, the senator is going to speak on an issue that is extremely important to our area, which is the uh, opening of the Canada-U.S. border. Um, it's important for so many reasons for our area, for the economy, uh, for the friends and neighbors that live on both sides of the border. Now, under certain uh, conditions, we can go north into Canada, but of course it's uh, uh, very difficult for Canadians to come south uh, into the U.S. Um, it's a message that we have put out consistently in a bipartisan manner, uh, the Chamber of Commerce has talked about it. All of our elected officials have talked about it before. But now we have new people involved. We have a new governor. Uh, we have a relatively new president. Um, so we want to get the message out to the folks that make these decisions on both sides of the board. How important these issues are to us, to our area, to our economy, to our restaurants, uh, and to our friends and neighbors, and, and the folks that come down here. So without any further ado, as they say, I'd like to introduce to you our friend, our senator, Senator Dan Stack. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, appreciate everyone taking time out of their day today and the, the county legislators for, for gathering for this important issue. I don't anticipate saying anything that hasn't been said before for the most part, um, except as the chairman pointed out, we do have a new governor. Uh, Kathy Hochul took office about two weeks ago. Uh, Governor Hochul certainly no stranger to local government, to county government herself. Uh, in western New York, on uh, a county that borders the Canadian uh, border, uh, she represented a district in Congress that uh, abutted the Canadian border. So she's been familiar as a local and congressional representative with the importance of this relationship, this unique relationship between our two countries, the longest unguarded international border in the world, uh, which is an achievement. It's a, it's a symbol and it's a sign of how strong that relationship is between our two countries. Now, I've been here several times before for formal and informal gatherings, press gatherings, uh, more recently down at the marina with Senator Schumer um, on this issue. And uh, again, what we've seen is a continuing pattern over the last uh, several months of an announcement that comes up at, around the time of the deadline that uh, we're going to continue with the closure of the border and we'll be We'll revisit this in a month. And then a reaction from local officials on both sides of the political aisle, at all levels of government, uh, expressing frustration that we can't operate an international border that willy-nilly. Uh, there has to be uh, transparency and a plan. There has to be metrics. Now, we've all been living in this uh, COVID bubble for the last 18 months. And uh, certainly in every other aspect, and certainly most notably early on, everything was tied to a metric. Are we green? Are we red? Are we orange? Uh, you know, what is our count? What is our infection rate? What is our hospital rate? And everything to how late the bars could stay open, to how many people you could have in a room with you, to whether and how many people you could have in your own house for our own Thanksgiving dinner was controlled by these metrics. We could shake our heads at the silliness of some of them or the, whether or not they were all science-based or whether they were political or not, but what, at least there was a goal. There was a goal post that you could see. I mean, it's one thing to have an, a frustration of a moving goal post, but to have an invisible goal post uh, affects something as important on these border counties as the status of the Canadian border. 
Now, when I was here with Senator Schumer and, uh, and members of the business community, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, my colleagues in state government, uh, a couple months ago, they were lamenting about the likelihood that we were going to lose the summer season. Well, guess what? And it's post Labor Day. Everyone's put away their white pants, right? And we, we, the summer season is over, and we've lost that. Um, and that's not to say that we just throw in the towel and wait till next Memorial Day either. What's coming up now is we have another deadline, September 21st. But what shortly follows on the heels of that? Columbus Day weekend. Anyone that's familiar with the Adirondacks at all knows that that's when everybody likes to visit the Adirondacks. We've got beautiful fall colors, the weather is nice, the bugs are gone, all the non-hikers uh, like to pretend to be hikers then, and, uh, and the, the area is bustling with activity, historically, including people on both sides of the border. Simultaneously, that weekend is the Canadian Thanksgiving holiday. There's a lot, it's a long weekend for both countries on both sides of the border that historically has seen a tremendous amount of cross-border traffic for family gatherings, but with the family gatherings obviously comes economic benefit, that there's economic activity that's generated today. That. So on the occasion that we have a long weekend coming up on the, shortly on the heels after this next September 21st announcement, which will be here before you know it, and the fact that we have a brand new governor new set of ears with a new uh, perspective. If I had a nickel for every time I was asked by a constituent or a member of the media, what do you think of the new governor? Isn't it nice that the new governor is not from New York City? She's from upstate. Uh, you know, I've got family that lives in Dyer County and, and Erie County, so they, you know, I'm not sure that they would consider themselves upstate, but they're certainly not New York City. And certainly somebody that's from Western New York uh, understands and appreciates the value and the importance of the Canadian border and getting that reopened. But we do have a new governor that, had, that has a different perspective. We're learning what all those details or nuances are of how she's going to govern, and that's fine. I mean, you know, I don't think anyone would expect to know, you know, exactly how she's going to handle every situation after two weeks in the job. But it is an opportunity for us to restate our bipartisan, our nonpartisan opinions. Again, all layers of government. My colleagues uh, on the other side of the aisle in the state legislature, all along the border, both houses, congressional representatives, they're all been clamoring to, one, reopen the border. Now, understandably, you know, there's still uncertainty. I don't, I'm not sure that everyone would say, just open the border and be done with it. I'm not necessarily advocating for that. It might be closer to that personal opinion than others. But I think what is universally shared is that we can't just keep saying every month, We'll let you know in 30 days. With no metrics, what are we shooting for? What are we waiting for? What What is the measurement that we are relying on? And my frustration, uh, and, and that of others, is that after dealing with this for many months now, we haven't seen any indication out of the federal government, out of the Biden administration, that they plan to provide that target. What, what are we waiting for? Is there is it an infection rate? Is it a hospitalization rate? Is, it, is there some other measurement, or is it a, is it a political deadline that you know that we're there that that's in play here? I, I, I'd be shocked if that was the admission. But you know, certainly in the absence of transparency and disclosure, people are going to wonder, and some people are going to be suspicious about it. Um, over the years, you know, uh, again, non-party across either side, there's always been opportunities given for people to question or to not trust what's coming out of their state government. Certainly, we've seen that in spades recently. Um, or their federal government, the judgment, the, their commitment, uh, uh, you know, or their motivations. And, and again, in the absence of telling people, this is what I'm looking at, this is what I'm waiting for, some people are going to assume the worst. They're going to assume this is politically driven, or there's a conspiracy, or, and, and, and that's not healthy for our society. And it's certainly not healthy for the people that want to go across the border to visit their loved ones, you know, it's an international border that has family members on both sides. It has commerce on both sides. So again, my personal opinion, and, and I don't want to put words in Senator Schumer's mouth, certainly, or, or Assemblyman Jones, or any of my colleagues, but they've all more or less intimated a, consistently a frustration that the border is still where it was six months ago, with no end in sight, with no clarity, with no picture, this is what we're looking for. So on the occasion of a new governor in Albany, and so what I've done, and I've provide you all copies of a letter. It's a very similar but not identical letter. One to President Biden, imploring him to get on with it, open the border, or, or at least, uh, at the very least, lay out uh, the plan. Um, that, that we're in mid-September now, and we still don't have a plan. We're right where we were six months ago. 
no plan for the border is inexcusable. I, it's not professional. It does not bode well for confidence in, in, in governance, our inability to come up with a, this is the plan for the Canadian border. And, uh, and then uh, likewise, on the occasion of uh, a long holiday weekend coming up on both countries, the same weekend here just a few short weeks ago, away from now, we don't want to wait and just have another September 21st. We've decided we'll, let you, we'll be back at Halloween and let you know. We can do better than that. We deserve both sides of the border, and certainly anyone that lives in a, pro a close proximity to the border, deserve better than that from our, our governments. A few months ago, it was the Canadians that were skittish, and we were talking about unilaterally reopening the border. Now here we find ourselves in mid-September, and it's flip-flopped, where the Canadians are the ones that are letting vaccinated New Yorkers in, but, uh, but the United States has not reciprocated that. And again, that's, that's no way to treat your best friend on the international uh, scene. So um, that's what I wanted to come here today, share that announcement, those, that letter that I sent with all of you. And certainly I'll take any questions on this subject first, and then if there's any off-topic uh, questions, we'll field those as well. Thanks for being here, everybody. Senator, um, when we have our U.S. Senator, you mentioned Schumer, who is the majority leader in the Senate, who can't convince the president of, you know, in his same party yes. to take action on this, how much influence do you think the new governor of New York can have in this? Well, I like the way you framed the question, Pat. Um, again, <laughs> because I have I have an opinion on this, and, I, and you're the the line of the vein of your questioning certainly is the, uh, echoes my frustrations. I mean, I've been in government long enough to understand majority and minority. Everybody that campaigns loves to tell well, I'll be in the majority, and I'll be able to get stuff done. And as you pointed out, not only is Senator Schumer and Senator Gillibrand both in the majority, they're both in the same party as the president. And one of them, Senator Schumer, happens to be the majority leader of the Senate. I mean, he's in the line of succession. He's number number four, you know, after the president, vice president, speaker of the House, Senate majority leader. I mean, he is he is as big a fish as New York State has on, on this issue. And and I stood right next to him at the Naked Turtle uh, down in the marina, and he was, you know, almost as strident about it as Gary Douglas, not quite, but almost as strident. Uh, you know, certainly for a politician of the same party, uh, you know, I, he didn't go over the line to criticize the president of his party, uh, you know, that, whose party he shares. Um, but he was, he was animated about it. And uh, again, at the time, I think we all left there thinking, you know what, there's movement that's eminent, and we haven't seen that happen. So then your question is, well, what can a uh, freshman, a brand new, two weeks on the job, uh, uh, governor, also of the same party, so there's not a partisan uh, variable in play here, uh, do to move that? The difference is, is that, and again, I'll talk a little bit of politics, but this isn't complicated politics, this is, this is office politics. We've had trauma in New York State with Governor Cuomo. I mean, a hot mess for a long time, and he's finally gone. Um, and now, we've got a, the honeymoon period. You've got a new person that's coming in that they're gonna wanna see succeed. Uh, they know he needs to get her feet on her and, uh, and uh, get it established. Needs to get a couple wins under the belt. Needs to resolve some issues. So there's a political factor here, and, you know, and there's a time and a place for good politics and good and good uh, policy to intersect. And so, you know, in the name of hey, what can we do to help the new New York governor, uh, you know, get established and get a win and get some? But again, this is a much bigger issue than New York. This goes all the way out to where I used to when I was in the Navy out in Washington State. I mean, this is an issue not just for New York, but the New York governor and one of the busiest border crossings on that Canadian border is in a position to say, Mr. President, thanks for offering the help to me and my administration as we get our feet under us, as we try to right the ship in New York, as we try to put this bad chapter behind us, aside, parenthetical, uh, you know, this embarrassment to our party. I, you know, I, I could use your help. Thanks for the offer of your help. What's high on my list, Mr. President? We need to figure out a way to reopen that border responsibly and quickly. She's in a position to deliver that message that Governor Cuomo couldn't because of his long tenure and all his other problems. He wasn't asking for any favors on the border. He, whatever favors he was using up in Washington had nothing to do with the Canadian border. She's in a position to say, hey, clean slate, I need this. What can the federal government do to help? And so uh, she knows that. 
most people that they think about it know that. But every once in a while, you need somebody like me to come out here in front of the cameras and announce to the world, you know what? She's in the position to ask for something we all want asked. And he's in a position to give her movement on this. And it, they can't, it, it's not going to be any one of those, geez, I'd love to help you, but sorry, you're in the wrong party. It's all one party. So the, the, the politics should not be difficult here for them. Um, but in the meantime, the people that are here, you know, I'm sure there are some Republicans, some Democrats, some that hate both parties standing here on these steps right now. But we all care about the economy, getting this right, and whether you're in my camp or in some of the county colleagues' camp, you know, hey, we're, we're ready to open the border, you know, at least to the vaccinated a while ago. Um, you know, that, that even if you're not in that camp, there's certainly, I don't think, many among us that would say, no, I'm good with just, you know, let me know four weeks from now, yes or no, and I'll wait four more weeks after that. That is not good government. That is not transparent government. Uh, you know, and, and that's not what a, a representative body like the Congress or the state legislature, uh, you know, should be about. So that's why I'm here saying, you know, Governor Hochul, congratulations. You have, an op you have a problem. It's a nonpartisan problem. And we, we all have a solution in mind. We want forward movement on this subject. You know, please use your, your bully pulpit, the opportunity you have right now with the president to get movement on this. And, you know, to President Biden, the letter that I sent to him, you know, I don't mention Afghanistan in the letter, as you can see, but, you know, certainly he needs to establish some level of success, uh, credibility, and competence that I think he's been short on in other areas recently. And so this is an opportunity for both of them to deliver for their constituents, again, not just in northern New York, but from Maine all the way to Puget Sound. You obviously sent a letter to Governor Hochul, um, and it is only a couple weeks into her term as governor. Have you had a chance to actually talk one-on-one -on -one with her about this? I haven't spoken to the governor since she became governor. And, you know, and, and she's busy every, you know, I, you know, I wasn't exactly having monthly conference calls with Governor Cuomo either. Uh, but, uh, and, I, I don't, and I don't think that's unusual. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, the good news here is that while she, she's only two weeks into the job and she's, uh, uh, you know, learning a lot of the details behind being governor, she's been the lieutenant governor for a number of years now. And, and, and you know, I mean, she's not new to this issue. And this issue, frankly, is not that complicated. And, and again, it's not like there's a political variable in here to figure out either. You've got the business community, you've got both sides of the aisle, every level of government saying, you know, we want this done, figure it out. If the Canadians can figure out how to open the border to us, how is it that the United States can't figure out a way to open the border to them? I mean, that's just, I mean, that, that, you know, not put too fine a point on it. it, it it's not that complicated an issue. Are you getting a sense in the past couple months that reopening the border has slipped even further down the priority list for the Biden administration, just with everything going on with Afghanistan? And how, how can you get that message across effectively? I mean, I know the message has pretty much been the same for a while now. Well, that's just it. Uh, you know, I'm one state senator. I'm one of, what is it, 10 or 11 states that are on the, the northern border. For, you know, frankly, right now, they probably more concerned about what they're issues on the southern border than they are the northern border for uh, other reasons. Um, so what can one state senator do to move that needle here? Well, you know what? I mean, we all have uh, a role to play, a, 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 an opportunity to, to voice our opinion. This will get some press, I'm sure. I'm sure there's some Dan Steck somewhere in Minnesota on the other side of the aisle maybe that's trying to make a similar point right now. Um, but the federal government and I was in the Navy for eight years, so I know a little bit about their bureau the federal bureaucracy. Uh, and uh, it makes the state bureaucracy look efficient. But they have thousands, tens of thousands of people at their disposal, on their payroll, to work on this. The United States administration, regardless of who the president is, ought to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Again. This isn't a new issue. This isn't a holy smokes. We've got a crisis on the northern border. This issue's been here for a year and a half. And we've never been told in the last six months, this is the timeline, this is the metric, this is the plan, none of that. That's inexcusable. Yes, I get that Afghanistan is a mess. Yes, I can talk a lot on that. Uh, I, as a veteran, I have a lot of strong opinions on that. Um, but you know, he's got a whole Pentagon uh, full of people that frankly some of them are thinking about looking for a lot of work, uh, but that aren't involved in, well, how do we handle the border issue with the COVID on, on the northern border? Uh, again, I, I 
I can't see where there's not enough bandwidth in all in all in Washington D.C. Um, for this administration to come up with a game plan, an announcement, and something that's transparent and understandable. This is why we have an open the board. And again, because I'll go back to in the absence of that, suspicion and mistrust will creep in, and it'll you'll have, you'll have one tinfoil hat group saying this is about some master plan to you know to ruin the economy and rebuild it in some other way, and we don't need that. You know, I, I, I choose to think that while I may disagree with some of my uh, uh, colleagues um, on policy and politics, that we all want what's best for the country. And I think right, right, right now that means get our economy going again in a safer way as possible without shutting down the economy in the name of science that people are debating, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, masks are needed or the vaccine is good. If you vaccinate, I mean, if the Canadians can figure out vaccinated to come into our country. Oh, and oh, by the way, if you want to fly into the United States, uh, that's okay. It's the, it's the, the land traffic. I, yeah, I mean, so how, somebody explain that to me from Washington. So no, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of people making an awful lot of money that have an awful lot of letters after their name working for the Biden administration that ought to be able to figure out and uh, plan for the border and, and post haste. Well, then, Well, I, I certainly think that the, one, the talent is here, and two, that the will is here, and three, that in the spirit of cooperation and big picture and getting it right, that the partisan nature of some of our lines of work can also be set aside. I have every confidence that a plan could be uh, developed by a state. Again, but you were talking about a 3,000-mile border. I get it. You know, So is anyone going to say, well, we're going to have an exception except for northern New York, they get to do their own thing? And I know that's not your the, the question you're asking. Um, but I, I, I think that uh, uh, the problem is that we lack the legal authority to do so. The border is a federal institute. Federal well, institution is a strong suggestion. Oh, well, you know, I mean, hey, uh, I, we'd go back inside here in a few minutes and, and uh, pull together a team and, you know, get, uh, get the Chambers of Commerce on board and some of our colleagues and say, let's come up with a plan. Uh, frustration I have, and I'll pivot away from Washington right now. I mean, now if we're trying to say, well, you look, you know, who's New York to start talking about Maine or Minnesota? All right, stick to your knitting and keep it to New York. All right, well, now we're talking about the, our own Department of Health. Who, oh, oh, by the way, don't forget, is right there with Governor Cuomo in culpability and in the hot water on the nursing home and, and the level of trust and the, 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 the cover-up and the doctoring of numbers and all that. Uh, I mean, I, well, I, well, I asked for Governor Cuomo's resignation in February. I, before that, I asked for Zucker's resignation. So I'm not sure that the Department of Health is up to the, the challenge right now uh, or has the moral authority uh, you know, to, to do so. I mean, they're, they're having a hard time answering the phone at the Department of Health. Um, so I, again, I think that this is really more a, a federal resources need to be brought to bear issue. But again, I, I you know, I, I, I can't imagine it's that complicated an issue um, where they, where they, ha where here we are, you know, six months after the development of, uh, uh, of a vaccine, and uh, we still don't have any plan. The Canadian board has been open for two months now to us. Um, I mean, this is really, the, you know, I mean, the the purview and the responsibility of the federal government. COVID and then uh, like four days ago, Moo was going to be the end of all of us. And now two days ago, they said, well, maybe not. Um, you know, I, I, I suppose it's, are we a cup half full or a cup half empty perspective on these things? Um, look, I mean, if you want to eliminate drunk driving, then close the roads. It's not an option. It's not realistic. It's not the right thing to do. Um, likewise, you know, if you, hey, you know what? We're going to make everyone live in a bubble. We're all going to wear body suits. We can't afford it. Is, is it worth the trouble, you know, is, is, at that point, is the cure worse than the disease? Um, you know, so, you know, I, I think uh, while, while, you know, certainly we're not out of the woods yet, you know, and, uh, and we've got, you know, questions on the efficacy 
the safety of the vaccine, which I'm vaccinated. Uh, you know, my family's, we're all vaccinated. I, I, I'm willing, uh, some of that for me is an easy. Every time I turned around, they say, you want to get breakfast today, you're getting the shot. I mean, you know, there was no discussion. That's how it is. So I'm desensitized to it, but I am sensitive that there's a lot of people that for a variety of reasons, you know, they're, they're not convinced that the vaccine or the mask or all the protocols are necessary or real, real. But I am willing to say, but you know what? It's still out there and it's still dangerous. And next week could be worse than this week. You know, I mean, we're seeing some of that. And, and again, that's why I, I led with, while I personally think you know, we need to get this border reopened yesterday, and there are some that say we should, should have opened that border three months ago, I understand that there are others that say, you know what, we, we want to be careful. And that's why I, I would take a plan. What is the plan? We've got no plan. We've got no, there's no word from the federal government. This is the magic number we're tracking. A year ago, at the press conferences that won Emmys that were later taken away, um, you know, we, we had the, well, you know, uh, this is the hospitalization rate, and this is the death rate, and this is the infection rate, and this is the magic number. When you get to this infection rate, we're doing this. And we're doing, when you get to this infection rate, we're doing that. There's none of that at the federal level on this border. And, and why? I mean, people should be, I'm asking that question, but I mean, more people with more access to uh, bigger microphones and bigger televisions than I've got here today should be asking, where's the plan? I mean, you know, I mean, 300 million Americans and a year and a half into this COVID, uh, the COVID of a century, uh, you know, pandemic of a century, we deserve better than that. Then we'll, we'll tell you on, on, on September 21st what we're doing. And, and oh, by the way, it'll be too late to move that needle then. It'll be, oh, well, we got to wait another, another month till October 21st. And so I'm trying to head that off now. And so I'll circle back to the opportunity here is we've got a new governor that hey, maybe she's not going to play as many political games as the old governor did. She's going to look at this from maybe a different perspective geographically. Uh, you know, she's got more of a comfort level, more of an understanding than somebody from New York City did as to what a closed border means along, along the, uh, the New York-Canada border. Uh, and she uses the goodwill and her new, st her new status. They're bending over backwards to do for New York now because of the fact that they had all, continue to have all the problems we did with the old administration and you've got a fledgling new administration that, that needs to get some things right and needs forward progress. And so all she has to do, in my opinion, is reach out and ask for that help. And it'll be there more than if she had been there for three, four years or two or three terms, like the old guy. So it's a plus and a minus, but I, I think it's safe to say that um, that this governor is has never presented herself uh, as an ogre or a troll or whatever you know name you might want to call somebody that's really rude and rough and, and bullying of people that they work nearby. Um, you know, so she, I, I don't think that's her style or her nature or her person. Um, so that's a that's a plus. You know, I mean, what are her politics going to be? I think that's going to evolve. I think some of that's going to be driven by you know, politics, and, uh, and um, you know, and we'll deal with that. So, I mean, do, do, am I expecting uh, her to take a right lurch? I mean, anyone that's here today, and me to say, I think that Lieutenant Gov Governor Hopeful is going to repeal the state back and bail reform. I'm not here to deliver that message at all. I don't, I don't think she's touching those. I mean, the, the initial moves that she made in the first couple of weeks has raised some ire, you know, you know that, that we're going to get from a COVID policy perspective, more of the same or very similar. Um, to what we've had, but again, in fairness to her, um, you know, uh, it, it is an evolving uh, issue. You know, that a week from now, some, uh, like I said, I mean, it made a little light of Mu, but I mean, it was the end of the world when they discovered Mu a week ago, and now all of a sudden they're like, well, we don't think it's that, that as big a deal as before. And then who knows? Two days from now, they could have new, new, new science or new data saying, guess what? Mu is, you know, the uh, the scores that we feared it would be. So, um, you know, uh, time will tell. Uh, I think with, with her on this, 
But again, uh, you know, not having any of the negative baggage that anyone that's in a job for, you know, I mean, after eight years of anyone, you're going to start saying, you know, this, this guy's, you know, full of himself. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to have an animosity. She's got a clean slate. She, uh, that, that, you know, the quote unquote honeymoon period. Uh, you know, so there's goodwill. I mean, everyone wants you to be successful. We, you know, as New Yorkers, we want to get out of the COVID funk that we're in. We want to connect to something that looks more normal, uh, more healthy for our kids. I'm not crazy that my son started school today wearing a mask. I, I really am not. Um, you know, I, uh, maybe, I, like I said, maybe she's looking right now and she just, you know, some, she found something they got to get two weeks notice. And, you know, they, so I'm willing to give her a little bit more slack on that. But again, with that said, I know a lot of people that are like, she's no good because she didn't get rid of Howard Zucker on day one. Uh, and I'm not going to argue with that crap. You know, I mean, I, I, I think that the DOH needs to change the leadership right now. I don't think that they're up to the job. I think that they've been a abysmal failure. And Governor Cuomo should have done something but uh, uh, about it. But um, I think that they were all in the same mess together when it came to their nursing home data cover-up and changing issues. Well, we had a brief uh, change of battery there, so okay. um, cut them off in mid-sentence. But it may be more for Mr. Henry. You guys have mentioned the economic repercussions of the border's continuing closure. I'm wondering if you have data or numbers of just what the economic numbers have been over the last year and a half with the continuing border closure and what the implications are. I, I don't have exact numbers. Uh, that would be a better question for Mr. Douglas were he, were he able to attend today. However, Christie's here. I don't mean to throw that at Christie. I can. I think I can tell you a couple of things. Uh, obviously, um, um, in spite of, I guess, uh, the border being closed, uh, our, our Clinton County economy is doing fairly well. Our sales tax are, are, are up, as you know. Um, our revenues are up. Of course, uh, some of that has to do with the planning of uh, this legislature and the, and the budget that we built um, over the last year. Um, however, whatever those numbers are today and have been over the last few days, um, I think it would be naive to think that it wouldn't be much better if we weren't able to get the Canadian citizens down here as they did to visit our, uh, to use our airport and to use our restaurants and to use our hotels and, and to use the services that are down here. So the numbers are okay. Um, I think they would have been better. Um, on the issue of the Canadian border, um, that's an important issue for our county. And I'll, we'll, we are here to talk about our county. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out that I have, I think, seven legislators, we have seven legislators here today. We have Legislator Castine, we have Legislator Potaker, we have Legislator Waldron, we have Legislator Hughes, Legislator Furrier, and Legislator Hall. And we're all here to speak with one voice on the Canadian border, that we in Clayton County need this border open. We need it exactly as Senator has said. We need, it, we need clarity, we need a plan, we need it done safely. Our job here as legislators, looking out for the folks of Clinton County, all of us trying to do the best that we can for everyone, is to speak to the Senator, to speak to our federal representatives, tell them what our plans are, what we need done in this county to improve our economy and, and get that border open. As the Senator said, I don't want to put words in his mouth, we know that's not going to happen tomorrow. But give us a plan. Give us a plan. It was worse than it was with COVID a year ago. We had a plan. As you said, we're Macros. If you go here, we can do this. If you get there, we can do that. I'm, not, I'm unaware of any of any. So I don't want to answer your question. If I could jump in um, to add to that, you know, uh, you know, certainly they may not they may not have that yet. They may trot it out and say, here it is. But where's it been? Where's the guidance been? Where has the metrics been? I mean, there's been no discussion. We've been asking for that. Uh, Pat, I think it was you that asked earlier about you know, Senator Schumer. Does he or doesn't he have the gas to get the, the, the border reopened? Uh, well, maybe he doesn't. Maybe that's expecting too much out of the number four person in, in our federal government who represents this state, has for decades, since I was a little kid. Uh, he, was in, he started the state assembly. Um, you know, maybe that's above his pay grade to move that needle on the border of the fourth most populous state in the country. But it's certainly well within his ability to have them come up with a plan. You know, all right, so Senator Schumer, maybe you can't deliver opening the border like you said you were going to a couple
couple months ago. All right, you know, sometimes politicians have been known to uh, exaggerate their own authority or their ability to get things done, overkick their coverage, as if you will. But certainly, the Senate Majority Leader from the state of New York, the senior senator from the state of New York, should be in a position to report back to the citizens of the state of New York, this is the metrics that are being looked at. This is the plan. For when we hit this, this is going to happen. It's not brain surgery. And uh, so, like I said, I mean, ask you all, you know, can Governor Hope get this done when, uh, between them all? And again, the beautiful thing here is party registration is not a factor. It's not a factor. And, and oh, by the way, it's not a factor here for a different reason. Because here, it, 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 there, it's not a political angling. They want what's best for Clinton County, as do I. Um, but you know, at that level, sometimes decisions get made, or you know, conversations are different depending on who's got an R or D in the room. They all got the same letter next time. So it's not a, whether it's a, a problem or not a problem. It's not a variable. So uh, it, 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 that that can't be the reason. And of course, if it was ever a reason, it would of course be an unspoken reason. But um, no, I mean, you know, they, I don't know how a, a governor and a Senate majority leader and a president, all from the same party, can at least come up with a plan. I, I, I'm going to play a double advocate move on you for a second here. Obviously, you're a Republican, and you're kind of complaining about the Democrats. And, well, if it was and a Republican that was in there, I'd be complaining too. I'd be a little but, embarrassed. But be well, complaining. but. Congresswoman Stefanik is third highest Republican in the U.S. House, and nothing has happened. So, how do you explain that? Well, who's the third highest Republican in the New York State Senate? Do you know? The New York State Senate? Yeah. Right, well, Offhand, that's, that's, I, that's, I should that's be that's able to do that. And and I, I, I can. certainly mean absolutely no disrespect <laughs> to uh, Congresswoman Stefanik, but you know, as you know, uh, you know, as been me blatantly clear to anyone that's ever been in politics at the state or federal level for a long time that majority minority that's a that's a, a big deal and, and but again uh, you know for her being on the other side of the aisle uh, making noise about this issue along with our Democratic colleagues uh, you know so again the, the, the message here has been nonpartisan from all levels of government and both sides of the aisle um, so uh, I mean let's put it this way you know if somebody's gonna say well Let's lay blame for who's responsible for not getting this done, and you put Elise Stefanik on the on the board with Kathy Hochul and Chuck Schumer and Gillibrand. Elise Stefanik comes in fourth on that list, in my opinion, and I think most people do. She's doing the job for the minority, and she's representing her constituents, and her representation on this issue in particular for her constituents is nonpartisan. She wants what we all want. We want a plan, and preferably the border open. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I get that, and depending on, you know, who's writing the story or, you know, what troll on the on the Facebook you are, you, you, you know, you're going to lay blame differently, but, uh, you know, I mean, I, you know, the Senate Majority Leader, the, the Majority Leader and a brand new governor, this this is more at their feet than it is at one of 27 members of Congress in the state of New York. But I appreciate your question, and you asked it very nicely. I appreciate it. Sure. Excellent. Um, so, th going back to COVID, um, I believe from my understanding, Governor Hochul has said the reason she can't do any uh, mass vaccination sites or mass mandates or anything like that is because we're no longer in state of emergency. She no longer has those emergency powers. As as, uh, as cases potentially rise, especially going into fall, winter months, are you guys considering maybe reinstating those powers so we can have mass mandates or testing mandates? couple things to, to unravel there. First, after the experience I just had, I will not be voting in favor of giving anyone with these kinds of emergency powers again. There was a handful of people at the time that said that this would happen, and I think most of us being feature people of goodwill and expecting the best out of our fellow elected officials said, no, you know, I wouldn't it's like that, and we, we just lived through it. Um, and it was abused, and it wasn't necessary. And when it was abused and unnecessary, the majorities still didn't have the gall to stand up and reassert themselves as a co-equal branch of government. So after seeing a failing of the executive and abusing the power and the fecklessness of the majorities in Albany to reassert themselves at the table, I, I, you know, that ship has sailed for this sailor. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't see, we'll need a comment to hit the state for me to say, let's, let's you know, grant emergency powers. If that happens, I'll, I'll, I'll sponsor that legislation. With that said, though, 
under current existing law, not a state's emergency, the Department of Health and the governor have an awful lot of authority to say yes, no, and that's what we're dealing with right now. We've got people that are furious. What do you mean that if I don't get vaccinated by September 27th? I've been a nurse for 30 years. I just put up with 18 months of health, saving all of you from COVID. And now you're telling me if I don't get vaccinated by September 27th, I, I have to lose my job because that is what Governor Cuomo said. And Kathy Hochul hasn't undone that. So she has the authority. She, the governor and the Department of Health through the governor have an awful lot of authority already as it is to say masks are required. I mean, kids are going back to school, they're wearing masks. Um, you know, there's no state law that says that uh, kids have to wear masks, and we're not in a state of emergency, and yet they're wearing masks. Now, don't shoot the messenger. You know, there will be people, that, uh, we get calls into the office all the time. Well, you know, can, can, she, can the governor do this? Yes. Our lawyers tell us yes. Well, that's not right. It's unconstitutional. It's legal until it's challenged and overturned in a court, and that hasn't happened. Maybe some of this, some of these areas are going to drift into that, where you're going to start having businesses or healthcare facilities or, or, or union groups saying that's it, we've had enough. Here's our lawsuit. And you don't, never know how that'll turn out for sure. But in the absence of that, there's a regulatory authority that these agencies have to say, as the Department of Health or as the State Ed Department, these are the rules, and uh, and, that, and and we're seeing, seeing that play out. So the governor still has an awful lot of authority to control this without the unilateral toll authority, which again is another argument that I would use. Look, we, we, didn't, we didn't need to do the uh, emergency powers, uh, you know, and in hindsight, you know, maybe, I think it was the right thing to do at the time, but if we knew how it was gonna be used and abused, and again, how the lack of will that the Senate and De uh, Assembly Democratic majorities in Albany had to rein him in, to hold him accountable, to issue subpoenas, for the nursing home deaths cover up or to issue subpoenas for the sexual harassment stuff. I mean, they started that impeachment hearing kicking and screaming and, and finally did it only because there was no other political way out. And as soon as he resigned, that's it, that's it, we're done, we're done, nothing to see here, it went away. So the, the will of the majority isn't there to hold the governor accountable. So like I said, after seeing that, uh, short of a comment hitting the state, I, you know, I, I'm not in a hurry to to reinstitute anybody's executive authority to that level. So just to be clear, with the powers that she does currently have, is she say wanting to open up mass state testing and mass action in place? Could she do that or does she need that authority? I, well, I, I, I always think it's cleaner and better and, and more proper for things like that that involve budgetary moves. To, you know, she needs to move money around, that's legislation. Um, but within the, the state's budget, she's got a lot of authority to, if she needed to open a vaccine, uh, uh, um, clinic again, I'm sure that legally she could. Uh, and, and now with that said, I don't think that that's necessary. I was always in the camp early on that, if you, especially when the supply of vaccine was so preciously limited. And oh, by the way, we were having the governor at the time, front of line privileges for testing and all that for family, close friends and powerful people. Um, but now the vaccine is widely available. We know an awful lot more about it. We're not talking about two shots. We're talking about maybe boosters. You know, that, that I think the hump of vaccine supply challenges behind us. But even then, when we had a very limited supply of vaccine, I was always in the camp. Start first by giving it to the county departments of health. Because guess what? As a former county board chairman and county legislator in Warren County for nine years before I was in the state legislature, the department, the, the county health department, they train and drill on vaccinating the, their population every year. Every year they go through, all right, we've got a small box vaccine. How are we going to vaccinate Warren County? How are we going to vaccinate Clinton County? So they know how to do this. We didn't need to reinvent the wheel unless we were looking to reinvent the wheel for a press conference and an Emmy to say, look how great a job I'm doing. They would have been better off taking those vaccines and giving them to the 62 counties in the state of New York early on. Then that way you wouldn't have, well, I was getting calls in Funds Falls. Well, I got to drive all the way to Plattsburgh to get a vaccine. Senator Little, and I don't, don't want to, well, she, she went to Potsdam to get her vac vaccine twice in the middle of winter. I mean, you've got, who needed the vaccine the most? People on the older end of the bell curve. Now we're driving in the worst roads, worst time of year, you know, diagonally across the Adirondacks to get life-saving medicine because Governor Cuomo said, I don't want it in Glens Falls, I don't want it in Elizabethtown, I don't want it in Plattsburgh. Well, he did put it in Plattsburgh, but you get my point. Um, so 
you know, the idea that, oh my goodness, we, we, we need to vaccinate everyone again and we need to have state vaccination sites, it's nonsense. We've got 62 counties that know how to do this right now and we've got buckets of vaccine. So the, the supply issue isn't there anymore. So there, there's, there's no reason on that front to ever have to go back to that anyways. Well, thanks. Um, no, I, again, I appreciate everyone's time today, and uh, and it, you know we've got a new governor. She's got some goodwill and some some, some chips to call in, if you will. Uh, hey, I need help. This would be helpful to me. I'm asking her to put this higher than wherever it is. I'm not saying it's not high, but if it can be moved up a few notches on her priorities, to ask President Biden to move it up a few notches on his priorities. But uh, you know, Joe, to, you know your point earlier. We're, We've got, it, it's a federal problem. And I'm not one to pass the buck, but they have the authority and they have the resources and, and it, it, it expands 3,000 miles. No one's gonna say, well, we're gonna do it this way uh, along those, except for these 400 miles in New York. You know, they're, they're not gonna do that. But but I do think that we could do it. You gotta do it yourself, it's true. All right, well, hey, thanks everybody. I appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, September 9th. Uh, 2021, <laughs> State Senator Steck and uh, the border crossing. Picture Thanks for watching. <laughs>